similar to Scientology's use of the E-meter, which is nothing more than a crude form of polygraph. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to pinch you. And I want you to just watch and see what the needle does when I pinch you. Just note it, okay? Okay. Watch. Can you see that? Yes. Okay, good. Just run through The E-meter, they believe, helps you uncover repressed thoughts. It didn't take Marty long to find a naughty thought of mine. Scientology literature is filled with code names and acronyms to a degree that is only common in intelligence documents like the Kubark Counterintelligence Manual. And some of the Scientology training routines seem to even be developed directly from the Kubark Manual. The Scientology training routine TR1 is called Dear Alice. In this training routine, the student is directed to read random phrases from Lewis Carroll's book Alice in Wonderland without showing any reaction to the bizarreness of it. In the Kubark manual, a confusion interrogation technique is described, entitled Alice in Wonderland. Of course, none of this provides proof that the principles of Dianetics and Scientology are based on CIA counterintelligence techniques. But it does provide evidence that L. Ron Hubbard was both aware of these techniques and willing to use them to gain control and power over others. Notice, for example, how Hubbard echoes the Kubark manual, which states that detention in a controlled environment and perhaps for a lengthy period is frequently essential to a successful counterintelligence interrogation of a recalcitrant source. Now, I want to give you just a little rundown on what you're walking into. It's too late for you to leave. I mean, uh, rolled. You know, it's quite customary for somebody to say, well, if you don't like this, you're here on your self-determinism and all that sort of thing, and you don't like this, why, it's volunteer, you know, and you can leave and so forth. Well, we don't do that around here. You're in, you're done. <laughs> so, we just close the gates right at that point. There are countless descriptions of Scientology's use of hypnosis and mind control techniques from a large number of ex-Scientologists, many from the upper echelons of the organization. Let us begin this half hour with the secretive and controversial Church of Scientology. In a moment, a defector from that church's leadership core will speak out in an exclusive live interview. Behind me is the ornate world headquarters of the Church of Scientology. This morning, a member is breaking ranks and silence and telling stories of finances, abortions, and mind control. Now, Albert, as I said, was getting more and more insane. He formed, I, I could see, a Nazi cult for me. And that's what they do to people. They take their private confessional folders, and they'll take anything they've confessed to, and they'll use it to try, to try to shut them up. The totalitarian leader of this paramilitary cult lives there in an armored building and often travels in an armored car. With copyrighted policies of terror and psychoterror... Former official spokesman and head of the Office of Special Affairs has left, bringing its secrets with him. People are not able to think for themselves where they really are being suppressed, where they're being abused. Because the problem is the government isn't doing anything about these abuses, which have been systematic and they've been going on for decades. I was speaking about the child Dianetics, the philosophy of Alvin Hubbard, that children aren't actually children, but they're billion-year-old beings occupying smaller bodies than the rest of us, and they should be responsible for just as much as the rest of us. And this sort of madness. She is one of Scientology's top global leaders, part of the inner circle, a confidant to its top stars. Now we can reveal she has been accused of covering up child sex abuse. I was introduced to Scientology when I was two years old. I eventually went to their boarding schools in the desert of California, you're under watch. You undergo daily interrogations with their version of a lie detector. As far as I understand, the, the, one of the major purposes of a government is to protect the people. And uh, Scientology is, uh, in my opinion, quite, quite dangerous. But what none of these critiques and exposés examines is the social and political condition in which Scientology began.
Let's get my relationship to this completely straight. So on. I am the writer of the textbooks of Scientology. About two and a half years ago or so, I even ceased to be a director of organizations. The government in the first place, I am not. L. Ron Hubbard's self-help book, Dianetics, was first published in 1950, out of which grew the first Church of Scientology, incorporated in New Jersey in December of 1953. The California Scientology Church would follow two months later, in February of 1954. With its claims of using newly discovered technology and methods to fix humanity and help people develop greater powers of mind, it can be seen as the first step of a movement that was about to explode on the scene in the U.S. The Human Potential Movement. And at precisely the same time that the Human Potential Movement was beginning to form in the 1950s, the CIA began Project MKUltra in an effort to discover mind control techniques by subjecting mental health patients to electroshock therapy, various forms of torture and abuse, and drugs such as LSD. Using unknowing Canadian citizens as test subjects, Cameron had developed a new procedure which caught the eye of the MK Ultra researchers as well as the Canadian intelligence community. He was hired by the CIA and the Canadian government to further explore the treatment which he called psychic driving. First, Cameron proposed that they would use intensive electroshock and LSD and other disorienting drugs to, in his terms, depattern individuals, basically to wipe the slate clean. The 60s would see the human potential movement come to fruition, adopting methods of mind expansion that involved the use of the same drugs the CIA was using for mind control in MKUltra. The widespread use of LSD in the human potential movement can be traced back to one man who coincidentally also had the last name Hubbard and who, like L. Ron Hubbard, was fixated on an image of himself as a ship's captain, Alfred Matthew Hubbard. Like L. Ron Hubbard, Alfred Hubbard had a tendency to make grandiose claims about himself and his past, such as an alleged angelic vision as a young boy in which he was given the secret to building a radioactive battery, a virtual free energy device. A similar angelic vision would inspire him to introduce leaders and social visionaries around the world to LSD, earning him the nickname the Johnny Appleseed of LSD. Alfred Hubbard gave LSD to leading scientists, politicians, artists, writers, and even church officials. What was not widely known at the time was that Alfred Hubbard was a former OSS agent and likely current CIA agent, who at the very least corresponded with MKUltra mind control researchers. By some accounts, Alfred Hubbard personally administered LSD to as many as 6,000 people around the world. Amongst them were Timothy Leary, who would encourage the youth of America to turn on, tune in, and drop out, and the author of Brave New World, Aldous Huxley. Ironically, Huxley, whose book Brave New World envisioned a dystopian future of slavery of the masses, through the administration of a state-produced drug called Soma, the effects of which are uncannily similar to LSD, would become the inspiration for the widespread use of LSD in the human potential movement. The use of LSD then spread into the streets of America's cities, providing an often bizarre sideshow that distracted mainstream attention away from the civil rights movement and left much of America's youth burnt out and brain damaged working directly against the stated goals of increasing human potential. The effects on the mind are explosively disrupted. The reaction to the drug is completely unpredictable. It can be the hoped for heaven or a hell full of horror. In a similar vein, the women's liberation movement of the 1960s was infiltrated and redirected by an admitted CIA asset named Gloria Steinem. Steinem spent years suppressing knowledge of her CIA connections. Finally, not only admitting them publicly, but taking pride in them. Steinem referred to her CIA work in Europe, informing on and disrupting youth movements as the CIA's finest hour. In the 1970s, the next phase of so-called human potential research began with CIA funding of psychic phenomena such as remote viewing experiments conducted by Hal Puthoff and Ingo Swan at the Stanford Research Institute, or SRI. Alfred Hubbard was also employed by SRI, and, perhaps coincidentally, Putoff and Swan were both high-level Scientologists. 
It's clear that the CIA devoted considerable assets to disrupting any possibility of a true revolution in human potential in the 1960s and 70s. And the formation of Scientology in the 50s was possibly the start of that disruption. But that is not the full story by any means. To understand more, we need to go to Europe. And we begin in France. In all of Europe, France would appear to have the lowest tolerance for any sort of cultic activity. But the actions of the French cult watchdog group Miveludes tells a different story. The name Miveludes is an acronym that translates to the Interministerial Mission for Monitoring and Combating Cultic Deviances. Miveludes' battle against so-called cultic deviances is so vigorous that they have come under repeated fire for human rights abuses and for working against not only the UN Declaration of Human Rights, but even the French Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen. Perhaps if Miveludes actually fought against clear cases of abusive cults, such as Scientology, their existence might be justified. But exactly the opposite is true. 